Let's get straight to our first guest in this hour, Sir Graham Brady. He's the chairman of the 1922 Committee, Conservative MP, uh, and uh, one of those uh, joining the COVID recovery, recovery group, urging the government to, well, get life back to normal as soon as possible. Good morning to you, Sir Graham. Good morning, Julian. Um, we, we are waiting still. Everyone's on tenterhooks for what we're going to hear on Monday from the Prime Minister after it's rubber stamped by the Cabinet in the morning. We're going to hear in the afternoon in the House of Commons what the roadmap is. A, a lot of There's a lot of speculation in the papers about what's going to happen. I think March the 8th, at least we know primary schools pretty sure are going to be going back then. Um, but other than that, a lot of it is speculation. A lot of it is people sort of, uh, you know, basically elbowing each other to try and sort of get, uh, get the, the Prime Minister's ear. What are you expecting to hear on Monday? Well, I, I think we know we will hear some good news about schools, although it's not clear whether it's just going to be primary schools or whether we'll get uh, all schools back. Personally, I think we ought to be paying much more attention to the damage that's being done to the interests of all children and uh, a great many younger people who are missing out not just on education, but on their social development as well at a really critical time in their lives. So I hope that will be as, as quick as possible. But uh, we also need a real clarity for so many different groups of people, whether it's businesses that have got to plan their reopening, uh, whether it's the increasing clamour that I and I'm sure all my colleagues are hearing from people who have uh, relatives in care homes, some of them with dementia, who don't know why they're not allowed to have visitors and it's causing real anguish for them. Uh, so I, I think that as we hear this continuing wave of good news uh, with the vaccines, both the rollout of the vaccines and their efficacy, uh, I think it's going to be the pressure that's coming from people saying, OK, uh, so many of us have been vaccinated. Let's now have some of the benefits of that. Uh, that's going to drive this forward. Well, indeed, I mean, this is the thing. We we were told by the Prime Minister back in February, and it was a very, very straightforward, uh, simple statement about about what we would have to do before we could actually see us, you know, coming back out uh, of lockdown. He said, if the rollout of the vaccine programme continues to be successful, I think it's successful beyond our wildest expectations, we can agree. He said, if deaths start to fall as the vaccine takes effect, well, we've seen that. I mean, deaths are plummeting. Seven-day deaths down uh, 26% in just a week, and we've seen them come down by more than 50 50% uh, from the peak. Um, so, and critically, if everyone plays their part by following the rules, well, yes, people are out and about who are allowed to be out and about. I'm allowed to travel to work and back. Uh, uh, other people aren't, but people are, I mean, it seems to me, obeying the rules. He says, then I hope we can steadily move out of lockdown, reopening schools after the February half term and starting cautiously to move regions down the tiers. Um, all of the things that he said at the time would be the criteria to, to set to return for schools being the first thing to come back. Well, that would be after half term, Maybe I mean, after half term, maybe he meant like two years after half term. I think we all thought he meant in the Monday after half term, which is next Monday. Uh, those have all been fulfilled. Why have the goalposts been moved when it comes to doom and gloom, when all of the data is telling us that the vaccine is working, it is saving lives, it is preventing hospital admissions and it's preventing infections? Yes, we, we were told, weren't we, that we could hear the sound of the hooves uh, drumming over the horizon of the vaccine cavalry coming to save us, which I, you know, I, I think obviously was was very hopeful. It's something that I think uh, persuaded a lot of uh, my colleagues in Parliament to support uh, the lockdown, uh, the uh, 6th of January vote. Uh, but, I, you know, I think the sound of uh, goalposts moving would be much less heartening. Uh, so we need to make sure that that uh, doesn't keep happening. And from my perspective, I just say that, and, and this is always far too easy for government to fall into habits and for government to assume powers and then keep, simply keep them. Uh, I would say that uh, the danger, really, the fundamental danger, is that government starts to forget uh, that these aren't uh, powers that the government has. These are our lives. They are the private, personal, family and working lives of millions of British people uh, who have had to give up uh, elements of their lives. And so it's not just a matter for government to... No, um, but, but this is it. Right. People, in... people are constantly talk about the government allowing us to do things and giving us the power to uh, reopen a business or to go and visit a, a parent. I still find it 
absolutely extraordinary that in 21st century Britain, in a democracy, when we are not, I'm sorry, we are not in the grip of a brand new virus now. That was in a, that was in February, March, April last year. And we got through that in big emergency. We, we, you know, we know so much more about the, the, the virus and, and what the risks are now and what the risks of lockdown are. The fact that we have perfectly sort of apparently rational conversations about, about whether the government will allow us to go and sit on a bench with people in our own household and have a cup of coffee in a park and not face a fine. I, I find that quite extraordinary. I find it extraordinary that, like North Korea, people are banned from leaving the country. I find it extraordinary that children largely are banned from going to school and that you're banned from driving to visit a relative uh, who, 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 who hasn't had any company for, for goodness knows how many months. Um, I, I'm just not sure this is, this is the country that I thought I lived in anymore. It's very strange, Julia. I think people, um, are, British people, certainly are very tolerant and put up with an awful lot. I think there is a point where where people then snap and decide that enough is enough. And you know, I, I think that in this instance, it is very much bound up with the vaccine programme uh, because uh, people have uh, been tolerant. They've accepted these restrictions on their lives. They've seen their children uh, suffering. They've seen relatives who have been isolated uh, for nearly a year now, in many cases, and uh, they put up with it, believing that they're serving the wider public good, but being told that there was a clear route out uh, that was visible and that would be measurable. Uh, so then to be told, oh, well, actually, we've decided there's something else that needs to be uh, yeah. achieved and secured. I think that's the point where people get uh, really pretty angry. Well, do you think people are changing their uh, actions on this? I know so many people who have, uh, you know, obeyed the letter of the law um, and the spirit of the law throughout this, um, and those in their seventies who've been very careful, and certainly some, certainly from December onwards, have been, you know, whether even even those in good health in their seventies who've been very very careful indeed, uh, shielding uh, and and making darn sure that you know they they wait until they get their vaccine, and and apart from two people that I know in the seventies. Um, every single one of those has now started making a decision to, well, um, I'm, I'm in a position to make a decision with myself that I'm going to now meet up with loved ones because I've had the vaccine. I no longer feel like I'm at serious risk and I'm going to make that decision myself, whether it's outdoors or even indoors. I'm going to make that decision for myself. These are law abiding people who, who, who've done what they feel has been the right thing all along, but now say, well, now I'm not so much at risk. Um, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to make decisions for myself. Do you think there will just be a a gradual just breaking down of the cohesive feel about uh, about lockdown laws. And it's that that's going to drive the end of lockdown more than anything else. Well, I, I think if government doesn't move at the right pace, and you know, this is where I think it makes absolute sense for government not to fix exact dates for everything now, but rather to look at criteria. Because if we are seeing the rates of decline in positive test results, in hospital admissions, in people getting ill, and in the number of people dying, as you said earlier, uh, if that continues at the same trajectory, uh, in a couple of weeks' time, there really won't be very many people who are being discovered uh, with a positive test. Yeah. And you know, when we reach that point, uh, people are going to be looking around and saying, well, why exactly uh, can I not see my children? Or you know, even more absurdly, um, I've been vaccinated, so is my brother in his 80s or whatever it might be. Uh, we've both been vaccinated. Why can't we get together uh, and have a cup of coffee? And you know, it's so patently absurd that it will discredit the rules if they don't move quickly enough. I'll just add that I think an awful lot of those people were behaving in that way, not because there were rules or laws, but because they thought they were doing the sensible thing. And they would have done it whether there was a rule or not. Absolutely. Exactly. 